रेस्पेक्टेड डॉक्टर मंजू शर्मा जी श्री अलोक श्री राम जी श्री माधव श्री राम जी श्री विजय सदाना जी रेस्पेक्टेड डॉक्टर चंद्रमा शाह ऑनरेबल स्पीकर फॉर दिस पर्टिकुलर टूडेज इवनिंग इट इज इंडीड अ ग्रेट प्लेजर फॉर मी टू इंट्रोड्यूस अवर डिस्टिंग्विश स्पीकर फॉर दिस वेबिनार डॉक्टर चंद्रमा शाह graduated from university of calcutta and completed her doctoral research in 1980 from indian institute of chemical biology and holds a phd degree from university of calcutta for her post doctoral work she was at university of kansas medical center from 1980 to 1982 and then from 1984 to 19 to 1983 to 84 she was at new york uh, city dr saha's research areas include understanding of cell death pathways and cellular defense processes in unicellular and multicellular organisms that have important bearing on design of therapies to various diseases kala azar which is one of the major disease which remains a neglected tropical disease remains a problem in our country and being endemic in certain parts of our country still and is caused by a parasite which is called as leishmania her work focuses on understanding the mechanisms of parasite death by various molecules as successful killing of this parasite these parasites would reduce the disease burden Dr Chandrama Saha is JC Bose distinguished chair professor of National Academy of Sciences at Indian Institute of Chemical Biology Calcutta she is a, a president of Indian National Academy Science Academy and a former director and a former professor of eminence of National Institute of Immunology New Delhi she is an elected fellow of the third world academy of sciences indian national science academy indian academy of sciences national academy of sciences and the west bengal academy of science and technology she is a recipient of several awards i mean it's an entire page and after pages but to name a few they are santeshwar bhatnagar medal insa award in 2019 Om Prakash Basin Award in 2015, 14th Pushpa Shrimachari Foundation Oration Award of ICMR in 2014, Professor Archana Sharma Memorial Award from NASI in 2013, Rand Bexi Science Foundation Award for Basic Medical Research in 2010, Dr. Darshan Ranganathan Memorial Award INSA in 2010. Shakuntala Amir Chand Award from ICMR in 2000 in one uh, 1999 in 1992. Uh, this is the fifth lecture of the series in Dr. Bansi Dhar Science Technology and Innovation lectures, and we have listened to very profound talks from four different eminent personalities in the past. Today, Dr. Chandrama Saha. is talking on emerging infectious diseases the risk and challenges and we are looking forward to another very profound and very thoughtful provoking lecture uh, with this i call upon dr chandrima saha to deliver the lecture please dr chandrima saha please thank you uh, dr das for the very kind introduction uh, i am deeply uh, deeply thankful to dr manju sharma yourself and all other members of the sri ram institute for giving me this opportunity to speak in this forum i wanted to speak on this subject because it is a very um, relevant subject of the day this emerging infectious diseases and you know if you can imagine uh, that even 2 years back we never thought that world would become like this it 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 upset our entire planet it challenged all the 
uh, this COVID-19 challenge, all the past assumptions and future certainties. And it was a historic assault on the human species. A virtual global lockdown was the only way that we could sort of uh, semi-control this disease. So infectious diseases, if you look over the years or eons of time, they have shaped societies, they have shaped cultures because the bubonic plague, the influenza, uh, the Spanish uh, flu, they have all uh, killed millions of people and they have actually determined the outcome of wars, the uh, extinguished empires, and um, also wiped out entire populations. So it has happened over the years, but now the threat of emerging infectious diseases is more because we have uh, changed our environment. Uh, so if we look at the, um, uh, this, this graph, you see that burden, the global burden of diseases is put at 14.9 million. But this is a direct effect, the direct effect that it is showing. Actually, infectious diseases can um, involve cardiovascular conditions, neoplastic diseases, the asthma and chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, and some others. So the actual figure here is much more than what is shown as direct uh, effects. Now, we have um, seen pandemics over our you know, over history. And for example, the, Jap the smallpox epidemic, where 1 million died, that was very early in about 8th century, when the population was also very less. But coming to the, to the Black Death, uh, the plague, where death toll was about 200 million in that time in history. And <clears throat> that actually uh, almost finished the population in Europe. Then in the 16th century, it was the smallpox and Spanish flu at, in the 20th century. Then we are, we are living through this pandemic of AIDS, which actually uh, was first reported in 1981 but it was there from about, it is estimated to be there about, uh, which came into the humans, uh, where, when exactly we can't tell, but in 1930, it was also recognized. Then uh, we had the SARS and the Ebola virus uh, uh, infections, and they killed people in less numbers because they were very well controlled by the healthcare uh, departments, workers, and, but, when COVID-19 came, we were caught unawares and the death rate keeps on increasing and the infection rate keeps on increasing. So it is important to realize that COVID-19 is not the only threat. There are other infectious diseases that may emerge from emerge and um, uh, disrupt human lives. Now, what are emerging and re-emerging infections are the ones which have whose incidence in humans have increased within the past two decades and whose incidence is predicted to increase in the near future. Now, there are previously unknown infectious agents or pathogens which evolved over time. Uh, known pathogens whose role in specific diseases have previously gone unrecognized. <clears throat> and known infectious agents that are spread to new geographic locations or new populations like the West Nile virus and some others and for the COVID-19 also, it has, um, it has you know, spread across the globe. Then re-emergence of pathogens whose incidence had significantly reduced. For example, if we, if we have smallpox now, whose incidence which has been eliminated from the earth, but if we have incidences of that, if it re-emerges, then that will be a re-emerging disease again. And known agents that have mutated to new forms. There are frequent mutations of these um, agents and uh, we get new forms of uh, viruses and bacteria and they come as new diseases. Now agents, most of these agents are transmitted by zoonotic transmission. That is very important to realize that zoonotic transmission is, is the one form of transmission that is most prevalent. And uh, there are, because there are pathogens which not only infect humans, but livestock as well as the other wild animals. If you can see in this diagram from nature, that uh, these, uh, the camels, the bats, the pigs, the mosquitoes, the, 
uh, the birds and, and the rats, they are, they are in close con commun con contact with us and they carry all kinds of viruses and that can jump species and become virulent. So the, uh, the, mo the most important um, uh, biological impl implications are that many wildlife species are reservoirs of these pathogens and that threatens in a way domestic animals and also human health. Uh, the wildlife uh, emerging diseases pose a substantial threat to the conservation of global biodiversity as biodiversity is very important for our survival. <clears throat> if you look at this, uh, uh, that, uh, this graph uh, or this um, uh, infographic that has, uh, was published in Cell in uh, uh, 2020 uh, in a paper by Anthony Fauci, where they show the, the diseases that are emerging and re-emerging. So the, um, I can't move this, uh, sorry. Yeah, so the red dots are the ones emerging, uh, blue dots are the ones that are re-emerging and the black dots ones are the ones that are created by humans. And this is the anthrax that happened in the US. So the picture here is quite grim in, in that sense. Um, <clears throat> we have so many diseases like the hunter virus, the chikungunya, the Zika virus, uh, the Ebola, the monkeypox. In fact, yesterday it was reported in the news that two monkeypox cases have been identified in Kerala. So we are in for a very difficult time. Uh, now, uh, the zoonotic diseases, if you look at, 60% of uh, human infections are zoonotic. 75% of emerging infectious diseases have an animal origin. And 80% of the agents with potential bioterrorist use are zoonotic path pathogens. And of the five diseases that we get, uh, we, which occur in humans every year, three are of uh, animal origin. So this has actually, um, uh, uh, this has actually uh, uh, been shown that we are in close contact with domestic animals. The intensive wildlife farming that has happened, wildlife farming is a very important thing now that happens. They are a potential source of these emerging diseases. Live animal markets are probably the most, um, most uh, important source of these viruses and bacteria, which we have seen in the one market, which is which is speculated to be, to, to be the start of the COVID-19 pandemic. Then wildlife hunting uh, is also an issue. So that the publications in, in zoonotic diseases have gone up from 1990s to 2020. Uh, so work has also, people have also started working on this because that of the realization that these zoonotic diseases have to be curbed at some, um, by some means. So the major contributors to the emerging infectious diseases are uh, actually the climate change that, all, that you know, and the human demographic changes, because there are demographic changes that keep happening. And the land use pattern also changes because the agriculture demands land, the, the urbanization demands land, and the population is expanding. The increase, there is an exceptional increase in international travel and commerce that uh, you know even when the spanish influence just uh, struck in in the in the 1919 the that uh, came because the troops were returning from world war 1 and they spread it so but now the the, the tourist uh, traffic is also carrying a lot of infections then conflicts there are a lot of conflicts all over the world and those conflicts are contributing to uh, to increase in diseases uh, then wildlife trade and consumption of wildlife meat as the bush meat, microbial adaptation and change. This is very important because microbial adaptation and change is the natural form of uh, bacterial adaptation and viral adaptation. So that is very important because they keep on adapting to these situations. They can change hosts. They can uh, evolve into more virulent forms. And antibiotic resistance is also very important because antibiotic resistance is also giving rise to some kind of, you know, um, uh, like for the HDR uh, TB. So uh, it is giving very difficult pathogens to us. Uh, industry practices are also contributors because some industries are, uh, you know, spilling 
uh, waste that are uh, contaminated. And, and, and also a very important part is poverty and social inequality, because it is within these uh, uh, sects of the society that uh, diseases are more rampant and they spread from there. So it, this is something that is a that is an economic issue that we have to really address. So this is one example of uh, spread of the Nipah virus. So the Nipah virus <coughs> is, <coughs> I'm sorry, uh, Nipah virus is very dangerous. It actually kills. It comes from flying fox, which is a natural reservoir. The fox will come and have the uh, date palm sap. And this sap is collected by humans. And this sap contaminated with the secretions from the bats or the, their body fluids will infect humans. The pig, there is an encroachment of pig farms into bat territory. And these pigs are getting infected by these bats and the large scale breeding of pigs and less cooked pig meat and international trade of pig meat is again um, uh, allowing this, these viruses to spread. So it can also go to uh, animals like horses and other animals as well. So, um, so the next um, thing is another um, uh, example is spread of the human immunodeficiency virus, which we are living through that pandemic, uh, where the virus actually came from the monkeys. So the simianades uh, adapted to chimpanzees. And from the chimpanzees, it jumped species to the humans. There could have been another intermediate host, which may have become extinct. We cannot trace this, but it has actually come from the chimpanzees to humans. And it started at in Africa and then spread all over the world. So um, in Central Africa, it started. So, so we, um, uh, we have to be aware that even, you know, primate wildlife is important and handling of them should be very careful uh, in, the, in, the, in the reservations where gorillas are kept, where chimpanzees are kept, the, the workers have to be very, very careful so that the viruses do not affect humans. Now, um, this, is, uh, this diagram actually shows the Anthropocene era. Anthropocene is something that is being called now where it is an era where humans have most effect on the earth. Holocene is the geological uh, time scale that we were living through, but now it is more and more accepted that they, this is the Anthropocene era that we are living through because it has sh shown the disappearance of forests, pollution of ecosystems, loss of biodiversity and global warming. Now species disappearance, you, we, we read in the uh, scientific journals and also papers that how species are disappearing. So it has important consequences on any functioning ecosystem because it disrupts the structure of interspecific biotic networks and affects the human well-being. And we have destroyed forests. Now forests, as we know, have been uh, <coughs> a source of food, supply of medicinal plants, home for a variety of animal species. And they have also uh, the biodiversity thrived within the forests. So this has really disrupted the, uh, the biodiversity. Our actions have disrupted the biodiversity, which has led to the emerging infectious diseases uh, taking uh, a plunge into the human population. Now we can, can we bend the curve for biodiversity? So if we, if we continue the business as usual, then the biodiversity loss will be significant as you can see here. But if we show increased conservation efforts, there will be some recovery. But if we are really serious and we make more sustainable production, more sustainable consumption, then the biodiversity can slowly recover. And by the end of the century, it would come back to what it was perhaps, uh, given that other uh, conditions are also taken uh, care of. So this, is, this includes in, um, uh, ha increased habitat protection and restoration, strategic la landscape level conservation planning, 
sustainable production with more sustainable agriculture, trade and goods, and sustainable consumption, including reducing food waste. So waste management is one issue that is very important now. The timber industry. I, I chose to talk about timber industry because that is where the felling of the forest soccer. And so this timber industry is, 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 has one of the main effects on forest per perturbation and alteration of relations between hosts and pathogens. So a decrease in pathogen diversity due to the loss of hosts can occur. And forest loss and fragmentation could also increase pathogen infections from wildlife as a result of higher exposition due to human visits to these places. So the timber industry can limit habitat fragmentation by reducing footprint size and number of roads and corridors constructed, discourage waste accumulation and dispose of waste regularly and properly to deter wildlife, build facilities for proper food storage and exclude rodents, bats and other pests, eliminate exposed standing water and ensure employees are properly vaccinated and healthy and also contact health promotion campaigns in and around um, about infectious diseases, the consumption of bush, bush meat and sanitation. These are uh, in addition to other, um, uh, other steps. I think these are very important, the education of people in and around the forests and, and also the workers that uh, take part in the timber industry. Now, climate change is another issue that is encouraging the, um, the emerging infectious diseases to come because it's an imp important driver. And uh, changes in ecosystem due to biodiversity loss and alterations in hydrological systems and freshwater supply, land degradation, urbanization, and stresses on fruit producing systems are all drivers of outbreaks. When we think about it, we cannot think about it in one go. But if you put them together, you'll see that there are so many reasons that why um, this emerging diseases are actually coming out. So climate, like biodiversity loss was one and climate change is another one. Climate change in a way is also related to biodiversity loss. Extreme weather events due to climate change affects the reproduction, development, survival, and livability of pathogens, hosts, and their interaction with human beings. Now, when there is there are floods, you know, how, uh, you know, cholera can come, how other diseases can come with, uh, with, with floods. And when there is, there is drought, the freshwater resources dwindle. And when they dwindle, they become very concentrated and it becomes a hub of growth of bacteria and viruses. And agricultural practices are implicated in pandemic influenza outbreak, like the Nipah and the West Nile virus transmission. Um, and of course, cholera and diarrhea are affected by episodes of drought or heavy rainfall. So climate change is uh, important and we do affect our climate through our activities. So that um, the emission of greenhouse gases has to uh, be reduced and there is a world agreement on that, but not everybody is following it. So one of the reasons of why greenhouse gases are, uh, are increasing is because of uh, non-conformity. So, um, if we look at uh, the human pathogen coevolution, which means that humans, when during evolution, when they were, when man evolved from apes, um, they evolved with a set of bacteria or and viruses within them. And it's a lengthy process of change. When they originated from ape like, we originated from ape like ancestors, it took five, say, uh, five or six million years to come to the modern man. And the modern man to uh, the one that walked out of Africa was about 70,000 years ago. All this time we were harboring the viruses, the bacteria. And you see the bacteria, bacterial growth is so fast. They are fastest reproducing organisms doubling every four to 20 minutes. So they can change their DNA, their DNA can you know, have mutations, create more and more uh, uh, you know, uh, bacteria that are new that are, have better adaptations. So the fitness or tolerance of the host or the fitness of the pathogen to resist host defense actually determines the outcome of diseases. So human pathogen coevolution is a very important thing to study and we do not understand much of it. But whatever we understand um, is very, has given us very important insights into, into um, the pathogens. Now, Without basic science, you cannot, you know, go far. 
So if you look at theory of natural selection by given by a giant of 19th century science, the Charles Darwin, that the organisms most suited to their environment are the ones that can adjust to the prevailing environment and reproduce most successfully to pass on their traits to the next generation. So the selective forces of the evolution acts on these traits. And when they're acting on these traits, there are mutations that's happening. And these mutations are generating organisms which are best suited for survival. So it can be a very virulent virus or a bacteria, or it can be a non-virulent one because we do have in our body uh, beneficial bacteria as well. And the theory of bacterial generation given by Louis Pasteur uh, around the same time as Darwin, although these two giants were contemporary, they sort of crossed their path, but they never really met. He showed that after several passages in new hosts, the virulence of microbial strain can increase. And by these new virulence and new contagions may be created. So he proposed that evolutionary biology can help us in understanding the emergence of infectious diseases. So the idea of harnessing ecology and evolution for controlling infectious diseases can be traced back to the work of both Pasteur and Darwin. So the race against pathogen is something that happened in the past, something that is happening now. For the host, like if, I, if we talk about ourselves, the human host, we are trying to protect ourselves from pathogens. And the pathogens, they are trying to create a successful infection. So the nature is with their selective forces are favoring the pathogen to acquire arsenal so that it can create a successful infection in the host, in the human host or in the animal host. And the selective forces are also acting on the host to avoid these infections. So during evolution, this race against pathogens by the host and the race for the pathogen to infect the host has actually shaped our immune system because at the bottom line of it, it's our immune system that determines our survivability. And that is something that we should actually understand very well. Uh, it is not that <coughs> germ theory was uh, not known in the past because in very early days, uh, discoverers like Ibn Sina called the germs as impure substances. They realized that this is something external to the body. And Giarmo Facastro of Italy, he actually called uh, the germs as seed-like entities. Now these you know, could not be seen because there was no microscope. But in the 17th, 18th century, uh, when Leeuwenhoek discovered the microscope, a completely unseen world was revealed to humans, which is that he saw a world which nobody has seen before. And that's when first, the, the discovery of microorganisms happened. And it was a little innocuous looking contraption that Leeuwenhoek made. And then he made sketches of the world that he has seen with it. And now we have the electron microscope. We have the, we have the atomic force microscope. We have so many of them. And we can do um, uh, discoveries that are beyond the concept of that time. So how much really do we know? So when an infection occurs, the host and the pathogen interact. There is an onset of the disease. There is a progression and there is an outcome of the disease. Now, if you, if you think about it, it has been really 20 years in the post-genomic era, but we have not achieved a fundamental understanding of infectious diseases as yet. We know much, but we do not know much as well. The fundamental questions about origin and root of infection, the transmission, the latency time, the progression, the host immunity and defense remain incompletely understood. And to add to this is that the systems are dynamic and they're evolving. So it is very difficult to actually say something that this is exactly what we know because our studies have to be also dynamic. So there is a lack of understanding when and how the host immune surveillance capacity is saturated. That also we don't know because we sometimes have multiple infections. And there, in case of COVID, we have seen the, the shock that is happening and people are dying out of that uh, immune uh, hyperactivity. So that is something that we don't understand that the, a system that is supposed to protect us suddenly goes into a hyper uh, mode and kills people. 
So also how the complex interplay of environmental factors, genetic predisposition and epigenetics determine pathogen susceptibility for a given host remains less understood. And also drug interventions change pathogens. We know, you know, from your antibiotic resistance, how they change the pathogens. So these are very important points that we need to uh, research on. And it is a co continuous process that we have to keep up. I just wanted to show this picture of our immune system, couldn't resist showing this, which was discovered, the cells were discovered by Mechnikov and um, who showed first that putting a rose thorn in a jellyfish, that there is an immune reaction. The cells would go and try to throw out the thorn. So the cells that we can now see with the help of electron microscope are dendritic cells, the macrophages and the neutrophils, which are our first line of defense. Then we have the B cells, which make the antibodies. We have the help of T cell, which kills, um, which helps kill the intruders and cytotoxic T cells, which actually kill the intruders. Uh, there is a complex process which happens because we have innate immunity, which occurs within hours and adaptive immunity, which occurs within days. Um, but it is a process that happens and it is another story and it is a subject of another um, uh, sem seminar probably because it's a very detailed um, uh, uh, process that happens, but the dendritic cell macrophage neutrophils actually kill pathogens and present it to our T cells, who present it to the B cells and B cells start making antibodies and also cytotoxic starts killing the cells. In a very simplistic way, it looks like this, but it is a very, very complex process that happens. And we understand perhaps a one thirtieth of what actually is, um, one third of what actually is there. So this is a very common picture nowadays that you've seen is the, uh, the, the coronavirus, which has the spike glycoprotein and the spike protein binds to the ACE2 receptor here. And these are the important residues here that are, uh, that, that those mutations can make it more virulent or those mutations can make it more or uh, less, less virulent. So we have a variant of interest, variant of concern and variant of high consequence, which is still not there, but these are the variants that occur with the mutations. Now, uh, if, you, if you look at one of the mutations, I just wanted to uh, give this example. When in a spike protein, you, uh, uh, aspartic acid changed to glycine, D to G, what happened was that virus became more infective. And it's a single mutation of one amino acid. And um, this variant occurred in England first, and you can see in the March of 2020, the brown ones are the ones where this mutant was occurring. It slowly took over in April. I mean, actually it was quite fast takeover. In May, it took over even more. And the entire England had this variant, which was more infective because the, um, the nature always favors the uh, mutations that can sustain a species. So the patients infected with this uh, variant had higher viral loads in their upper airways than did patients with this D variant. So the D variant is non-existent now. So this is the population genetic analysis indicates that the G increases in frequency relative to D in a manner consistent with the selective advantage. Selective advantage is something that I am talking about the, uh, the theory of Charles Darwin. Now it is also the adaptation to new host. The, there was a chikungunya virus outbreak which occurred in 2005 in La Reunion Island in few thousands. It was just a few thousands. But suddenly in 2006, there was a huge outbreak of thousands of cases. Now, why did that happen? Because there was a muta mutation that happened where uh, they had a mutation at the position 226 of the E1 protein, which increased the vectorial capacity of the Aedes albopictus uh, mosquitoes, which are known for their anthrophilic behavior, they would bite humans more than the Aedes aegypti, which was their conventional, um, uh, conventional intermediate hosts. So the mutation allowed the virus to adapt to a new host. So these are all the things that we should remember that these things can happen. So how do we actually tackle this are the crux of the matter that we have to work on. So um, this is one adaptation that happens, and this is as per Charles Darwin's theory. 
Now, in there is something called ev evolutionary rescue, where uh, uh, a virus comes or a bacteria comes, who are uh, who become resident and is not virulent. That goes on, but then they will go on for a long enough time so that a virulent strain, a mutated strain, will arise. So this is a process called evolutionary rescue, which persists due to natural selection acting on heritable variations. So um, a large outbreak cannot be generated by this resident strain, which is shown here, but a large outbreak can be generated by the mutant strain. So this evolutionary rescue is a thing that is happening all the time. <clears throat> and there is a, something called evolutionary trade-off. Evolutionary trade-off is a situation in which evolution is not able to optimize one part of a biological system without compromising another part of it. it evolution is not perfect. So highly virulent virus strains have countered selection because killing their host is detrimental to their epidemiological fitness. If you see what happened with COVID-19 is that in the initial, uh, uh, initial strain that came, that killed many people, but that is not the what the virus wants. The virus wants to thrive and infect more people so that its species can go on thriving. So the, the virus becomes less and less virulent. So if you look at HIV, HIV is measured as the inverse of the time to get AIDS when no treatment is given. So what happens is increased virulence for HIV. If a person infected with HIV has a high virulence and it is very in infective, it comes with the increased probability of transmission per sexual contact, but the subject may have a short survival. The person may die. But if the trade of originates from these two opposite forces, like the milder HIV virus is co will cause a mild HIV infection, which, which is poorly contagious, but it will spread to many people. So, so this is, these are the kind of trade-offs, evolutionary trade-offs that also affect a virus. Uh, uh, emerging virus will also be affected by this. So we come to something called One Health. So now it has been realized that the disease of the animals, uh, we are, our health is linked uh, to the health of the animals. So we have to take care of that as well because we are, we depend on animals for our, as our food source. We depend on animals for various other things. So that is why it is essential that we should look at animal health and human health. We uh, get milk, we get um, other products from animals that are very important for our, our survival. So we, one health issues, the common one health issues are antibiotic resistance, the vector borne diseases and diseases in food animals and contamination of water. If we look at the rural belt, we see that the animals are staying in very close proximity with the poor people who in probably sometimes in the same rooms. So we really have to uh, see how animal health can be protected. Here we require the cooperation of clinicians, the public health practitioners, the epidemiologists, the veterinarians, agricultural workers, pet owners, food sources, and for the environment, of course, the ecologists and wildlife experts. In addition to these, we need other relevant players because for policy, only science or only veterinarians or clinicians will not help. For policy, we need policymakers, we need law enforcement, agriculture communities, um, and even pet owners and, and people from anthropology, sociology, and psychology, which forms a total, um, uh, a total group of people who can actually help us to understand the emerging diseases looking forward. Now, there are technologies for, for tomorrow that should be, that is, there are ongoing research, but there should be more trust in these areas, is to evolve materials that do not encourage growth of pathogens for use on instruments in hospitals and other public spaces. You can imagine that there is there are hospital instruments that would be the fertile ground for growth of pathogens, no matter how much you clean it with alcohol or any other, uh, you know, the, 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 any other chemicals. But if we have a surface which is uh, 
which do not permit bacterial growth or viral growth. That would be the ideal of it. And design biomedical products that will discourage growth of bacteria and viruses in wounds or injury when applied with medications. Because by, when we apply the bandage, bandages with, these, uh, the, with the medicine, it, it, it sometimes do not discourage growth of bacteria, sometimes bacteria grows. So these materials also should be improved. So the growth of the pathogens are reduced like antimicrobial coats for all medical devices that we use, the, the tubes, the, the intubations that go in. Also the better disposal techniques for agro waste, biomedical waste, industrial waste. And this involves collection of this waste, transportation, the storage services, the treatment and disposal services and recycling. And, and the most important I think at this point is improvement of incineration methods for organic materials. We had a problem uh, during COVID when human bodies could not be uh, disposed of because we did not have uh, incineration. Incinerators were working over time. Now there are plasma in, in, in incineration methods uh, that can uh, be developed. And I'm sure those work are going on, but I think we need to put more thrust on these. Now, if you look at the science of it, we know we need to, to have a detailed molecular understanding of basic principles underlying the dynamics of host pathogen interactions. The onset, the progression and outcome of infections is missing for many microbial, viral, parasitic and zoonotic pathogens. We know that because there are so many pathogens, there are so many diseases and we, we, we have worked, we have discovered many things, but there are many issues for a particular uh, pathogen that we may not have discovered. And also as I am over and over laying the, um, over and over saying that the di this is a dynamic system. So host also changes, a pathogen also changes. So we have to keep up our research with the pace of their changes. And the fundamental questions about origin and root of infection, transmission, latency time, progression, host immunity and defense. I think immune system needs to be really explored with more modern technology and understand why immunity suddenly protects us, suddenly turns against us. So this is an important issue that we still don't understand. An uttermost genetic complexity of the individual host and the adaptive potential of pathogens is important. Um, and then how infection by a single pathogen affects susceptibility to super infections by other pathogens. You are infected by one pathogen, but as soon as you get susceptible, the other pathogens can come and infect you. So how do we avoid the super infections? So, and when and how the host immune surveillance actually is saturated in these cases? It's very important to understand. And how lethal septic shocks cause a catastrophic and progressive dysregulation of host immunity. We have seen that in case of COVID-19, uh, that how um, uh, these shocks have happened and people have actually died. So, but we do, do not understand about the immune storm that happens, why interferons go up and why immune system is all of a sudden hyperactive. It's so much hyperactivity that it kills the person itself. So how the complex inter play of epigenetics, environmental factors, and genetic predispositions determine pathogen susceptibility. It's very important because we have something called HLA molecules in us, which presents the antigens. Each of us has a, um, a particular HLA footprint, and that determines our ability to, to, to avoid a disease because not everybody was infected by COVID. Many people got exposed to COVID, but it was not, was not infected. Uh, why is that? Because there are studies uh, in, in, in Mexico with a tribal group that they have a protective allele. Um, these studies are very difficult to do, but these studies should be done because you can then predict whether, predict, especially for the healthcare personnel, predict whether a person is susceptible or sensitive to the disease. So accordingly, deployment can be made. So HLA studies are very difficult to do, but one must do it. And there are very few, I would say four or five studies that I have seen with the COVID-19 
and there are protective uh, alleles and non-protective alleles. So that actually predicts how a person will react to a particular pathogen. And factors driving the evolution of pathogens uh, include increasing chemical diversity of drugs because the drugs, newer and newer drugs are also coming and that is also changing our pathogens. Um, it is also required, as I have mentioned before also, that how environmental events such as habitat alteration, biological invasion, climate change and pollution alter the risks of emergence and transmission of viral, parasitic and bacterial diseases in our uh, animals and as well as our, our cells. So the support, uh, the support of technology should come uh, where we should invest in focused research programs to develop vaccines, therapeutics and diagnostics, along with studies in nutrition. Nutrition, nutrition is very important. All along this, um, this uh, COVID period, uh, the National Academy of Sciences have talked about nutrition. There were several webinars on nutrition, which were very informative because nutrition is the thing which perhaps has the best effect on your immune system because that uh, our immune system depends on, on, on nutrition from what we get. It is our inherent system, like any other body system. Modify the existing education curriculum to include translational courses that provide research and entrepreneurial training during graduate programs. Increase and sustain financial investment, both public and private, to enhance the scale of innovation of India. I, we have 70,000 70, startups now. So the scale of innovation is going up. So that is, that is we are very hopeful there. And uh, we're now in models where government make, can make an equal contribution to private fund is, uh, should be explored and uh, would sustain the investments in this space. Uh, we also should maintain a continuous dialogue between researchers, private sector funders, and the regulatory community, both at state and national level. And what is important is researchers, the basic researchers should be in contact with clinicians and the industry so that the whole cycle is complete. And ensure, I think it is very important that you should ensure that civil servants in the regulatory systems are up to date with advancements in technology. So I see a great hope there because if this is to be believed that this is a uh, connectivity or the hub of uh, researchers that are connecting with each other, this happened after the COVID-19 pandemic struck us. And this is a very hopeful um, uh, development. And so uh, we know so much, yet we do not know enough. So thank you very much for your attention.